microphone at that time. So with that, let's all give um, Dr. Vanak a nice warm welcome and let him take over our screens. Thank you, uh, Julie, for that very warm welcome. Um, it, is, it is my pleasure to uh, be here and, well, virtually uh, be present at the University, of the, at, the, at Utah State University um, to give you this talk. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I do wish I could, uh, I could come and actually visit sometime uh, and maybe in the future that possibility might reopen. Uh, but for now, let's uh, use this lower carbon footprint method of interacting. Uh, so I shall go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen so we can stop my presentation. Um, here we go. <coughs> Excuse me. So today I will be talking about um, one of our closest friends and allies, uh, the domestic dog. Uh, unfortunately, they do land up in the wrong places at certain times. But hey, who doesn't love dogs? I mean, all of us do, um, except for you cat people out there. Um, but for those who, who do love dogs, you know, we have a really, really strong bond with them, strong relationship with them, um, as do I. I have a couple of dogs at home and my children love them, of course. But I was not always a dog person. Um, when I started my wildlife research career, I was studying cats. Uh, big cats uh, amongst these. So this is what I did my master's research on. And then I had planned to do my PhD on these guys, the Asiatic lions. But as luck would have it, uh, and politics, of course, there's a, there's a lot of politics in, in studying Indian, uh, Indian carnivores. I had to um, move down the, the size ladder, so to speak, and also switch from cats to the canid family. So then I started, I decided to do my PhD on these little fellas. Um, these are Indian foxes. Now, um, I still wasn't very far from tigers because I joined the University of Missouri and lo and behold, the mascot are tigers. Um, while I was doing my PhD research at, um, well, at least while I was starting to do my PhD research, I'm just gonna try and move the screen across. There you are. Um, I noticed that, and so this is what most of my PhD research involved was capturing animals um, and putting, uh, putting radio collars on them. This was back in uh, 2003, 2004. And uh, practicing the usual art of uh, VHF telemetry, trying to track the animals down. But I noticed a curious thing happening um, when we were setting out the camera traps in these in these habitats. That the most common carnivore uh, in my study area were not the foxes, but rather domestic dogs. So then I switched my entire PhD study to start looking at the impact of domestic dogs on, on native carnivores. And that then became, um, uh, or that rather that, that opened a huge different, huge window of opportunity for me to start studying not only the impact of dogs on carnivores, but also on other wildlife um, and eventually on people. Um, a few years later, um, once, I had, once I already had a, a faculty position, I had a chance to go to uh, the historic city of Jerusalem in, in Israel. Um, and there I went to the museum of uh, the, the Israel National Museum. And this, this uh, particular structure holds the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's also one of the most famous famous um, uh, exhibits there. But what actually captured my attention was this um, exhibit. Now this is a particularly special exhibit because this one is, this is one of the first evidences of 
uh, human interaction with domestic dogs. So this is one of the first physical evidences of it. So as you can see here, this woman was buried along with her dog. Now this is one of the earliest known um, uh, fossil evidences for the domestication of dogs. As most of us know, dogs of course have evolved from wolves um, or rather have been domesticated from wolves. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, uh, debate in, uh, in the literature and amongst uh, dog wolf experts about how this came about. Um, but we know that uh, most of the evidence points to a early domestication of dogs uh, somewhere in South and uh, Southeast, uh, in, in Central and Southeast Asia, okay? We also know that this may have happened or rather that, that dogs and, and uh, wolves may have crossbred back and forth over their evolutionary history. Okay. No matter, um, currently dogs, because of their close association with humans, okay, are now globally distributed. Okay. And we can see the signature of that domestication in their body structure. So for example, on, um, on the left of the screen, you can see a typical wolf skeleton and skull. And on the right is what a typical dog should look like. Um, and and the, the, the process of domestication has rendered dogs with weaker musculature. So their, um, their bones are weaker, their skulls are smaller. Therefore they have lower uh, jaw crushing powder, uh, power. Um, they also can't run as fast as wolves can, except of course for the, for the racing breeds, which were bred specifically for that. Okay. But in general, the average dog is much smaller than wolves. In fact, our domestication process has led us to treat dogs and pamper them so much that, you know, we've, uh, we've sort of fully uh, humanized them. We pamper them constantly. We provide them all sorts of um, all sorts of food. We take them to parlors and salons for for beauty treatments. We stitch clothes for them. Okay, but in most of the world, they are they live slightly freer lives, so to speak. They are part of the human subsidized cycle. Okay, um, and this consists of. A, a cycle of, of human food production that then enters both the natural world as well as domesticated animals. And domesticated animals tend to benefit the most from human production of food. Dogs in particular, um, along with cats and rats, have really, um, have really benefited a lot as a result of which globally, they're the most abundant terrestrial carnivore. As a result of this, dogs can now um, claim, to have, claim to have the impact, not just on humans, but a whole host of other animals as well. Dogs across the world survive on a variety of foods that are provided by humans, um, either through direct feeding or through indirect feeding where they feed on garbage um, or scavenge from carcasses. As a result of this, the global population of dogs is close to a billion uh, with roughly a third of these in China, Indonesia, and India. And now, I, I just wanna remind everyone again that um, the systems of domestication of pet or dog ownership that you would normally see around you in the US and in most of the developed world, for example, in Europe, is not the same that you'd find in, in most of the developing countries where dog, uh, dogs are not as tightly associated with humans in terms of their ranging behavior or their reproduction. So in many ways, they do behave in a feral state or in a semi-wild state uh, in, these, in these countries. 
even though they may be heavily dependent on humans. Now, you know, um, even if dogs have changed in appearance a lot, they still uh, did come from wolves and therefore retain many of the same char characteristics that wolves do. They are carnivores. As we know from a lot of literature over the last 40, 50 years, that carnivores can have really high impacts on ecosystem processes. Um, and there's a range of, of really high impact papers that have showed us these effects. Carnivores can have top predators, top carnivores can have impacts not just on, on predator or on prey populations, but they can also have impacts on predator populations, which in turn can have effects lower down in the trophic cascade, in the trophic chain, uh, and even trigger trophic cascades. In addition, they can also have impacts on, um, on, sca on the scavenger community. Um, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years or so, this is now becoming increasingly studied. So the impact of dogs in particular being the most um, widespread terrestrial carnivore, their impacts on all of these other species is becoming increasingly studied. Um, so for example, my former, former PhD advisor, Matt Gomper uh, in this edited book has, uh, is one of the first books looking at the impact of free ranging dogs on wildlife conservation. So in this talk, I, I shall uh, briefly touch upon three main aspects of the interaction of dogs with, uh, with wildlife. One is on predation. Um, another is competition for food with co-predators, aggression and killing with co-predators, and finally disease-mediated interactions. Now dogs being predators, uh, inefficient as they are, uh, can still have fairly massive impacts. And this is because of their sheer numbers. Sometimes numbers are also not required. For example, this one, just one dog killed 500 kiwi in, uh, in New Zealand in just in over a period of six weeks. Now kiwi is of course endangered in New Zealand. So this is a huge loss to that local population. Um, Julie Young, uh, who's, who's of course here at USU, um, found, for example, that in Mongolia, up to 34% of Argali, which is a wild sheep there, 34% uh, of mortality of Argali was attributable to domestic dogs. Uh, I've been studying this in India for a very long time. We find that uh, dogs kill a variety of, of herb herbivore species, often inside protected areas. So the question we ask then is that do dogs behave like other invasive species? Do they have the same kinds of devastating impacts as, uh, as other uh, well-known invasive species across the world? To investigate this, we first started off looking at um, surveying a wide range of people who had uh, who were familiar with uh, with wildlife or wild systems, okay? And we wanted we were very conservative in this survey of ours because it's very often difficult to directly observe uh, wild uh, you know any kind of predator attack. So uh, rather than go about and try and collect this primary data ourselves, we decided to survey people who were familiar with. Uh, with wild spaces or who tended to uh, visit wild spaces often, such as photographers, researchers, forest managers, wildlife managers, and so on. Um, so of the ones that we in interviewed, 73% um, of them reported observing dog attacks on wildlife. That's quite high. Um, in all, we, we received 403 attack cases from the survey and we got an additional 57 attacks from the print media. And these attack cases were recorded all over India. Um, and we found that up to 80 species of birds, mammals, and reptiles 
was reportedly attacked and killed by attacked by dogs. Of which, as you can expect, um, mammals constituted the highest. Um, ungulates and other carnivores were most often observed being uh, attacked by dogs. 57% of these attacks were led by packs of dogs and 45% of these attacks led to death of the animal. And this was as observed. Clearly this is an underestimate still. Worryingly, um, many of these animals or many of these species that were being attacked were, um, were endangered. So they were either in the vulnerable, near threatened, endangered or critically endangered species according to the IUCN red list. But they were also, um, they were also uh, under some protection under, in the Indian wildlife laws. So even if they were not globally endangered, they were still uh, endangered in India. Now some species such as the great Indian bustard is a critically endangered species and their numbers are down to less than 150. And we had reports of dog attacks on these on the species as, as, as well. And this is really, really concerning. Also of concern was that uh, most of these dogs were not accompanied by humans. So basically they were not being used by humans for hunting, but rather they were hunting on their own volition. Um, many of these uh, uh, attacks were, were by packs of dogs, which means that they could bring down much larger prey. And 36% of these attacks uh, happened inside protected areas. These patterns very closely mirror um, what we found even at the global level. So a bunch of a bunch of um, bunch of us got together, uh, led by Tim Doherty from Australia, and we analyzed the IUCN um, uh, red list and looked at which species in the red list were uh, threatened by dogs, and we found very similar to what I what we found for India, we found that over ninety species of mammals. 80 species of birds, 22 species of reptiles, and three species of amphibians um, were listed to be impacted negatively by dogs. Uh, the most common kind of impact was, of course, predation, uh, followed much low, lower by disturbance, disease transmission, competition, and hybrid, hybridization. So this is the impact that dogs can have as predators. What about competitors with other wildlife? So you can have competition for food and you can have aggression and killing. Um, many cases were reported of dogs directly attacking and killing carnivores. Um, this is from the Himalayas and from Nepal. There's a pack of Tibetan mastiffs killing a golden jackal. Uh, this video here shows, and I don't know if you, you can see clearly, but you, but you can see from China. You can see a pack of dogs chasing a snow leopard. This, this is another uh, endangered species. A photo here of uh, dogs uh, cornering a snow leopard as well. And one of dogs eating blue sheep, which is a principal prey of snow leopards. So these cases are reported from across, uh, across the world. Uh, there's increasing studies being done, especially in South America, where several cases of dog impacts on wildlife are being reported. So as we know from the literature, uh, interaction between wild carnivores is size dependent. So larger carnivores tend to have negative interactions with medium sized carnivores, which in turn will have negative interactions with carnivores smaller than them. And this is exactly what we see with, uh, with dogs as well. So the final kind of interaction that we have and one that is probably um, most, uh, most, mo most uh, um, which will likely have the largest impact over the shortest period of time is disease mediated interactions between dogs and other carnivores. 
So dogs are the known reservoir of several uh, uh, diseases that have been known to affect a wide range of carnivores. Um, diseases such as, or viruses such as canine distemper virus, rabies, uh, canine parvovirus, and they've been the known, so dogs have been the known source of several epidemics in endangered wildlife, such as African wild dogs, Ethiopian wolves, uh, and Indian foxes as well from the study that I had done. A lot of these impacts really depend on their degree of human of association with humans. So uh, the top category of dogs that most of you would be familiar with are the owned uh, dogs which have whose movements are, are restricted and they are always under the control of their owner. The second category of dogs that you'd encounter if you if you visited any city um, across the developing world, uh, and um, and in many cases even well, there are even some cities uh, in the U.S. that have uh, populations of dogs in in urban areas, uh, cities like Baltimore, for instance. They used to have uh, urban free range, ranging dogs. I'm not sure if they still do, but if you came to any city in India, for instance you would see large packs of dogs roaming the street. And they are either fed by people or um, they scavenge from garbage. If you went across the countryside, you would see uh, rural free ranging dogs. Now these are dogs which are actually owned, but they are again completely unrestricted and they don't receive any medical care by their owners. Uh, most of them are associated with households or with farms uh, and tend to have fairly large ranges around those farm farms. Um, another category are village dogs, which are strongly associated only with the village and they very rarely venture out. The last category of dogs are feral dogs. Now there are very few populations of truly feral dogs. What do we mean by feral? Um, Feral in the true sense means they've gone completely wild. So a domestic species that has become completely wild and is now free from all human interference or is no longer dependent on humans for their resource, uh, for, um, for their food or for other resources. And there are very few truly feral populations of dogs across the world. Um, some of these nomenclatures though are not mutually exclusive. For example, rural free ranging dogs and village dogs um, may fall uh, in mutually, they, they, may, they may overlap, okay? Now the impacts of all of these dogs um, and their location, depends on their location, their role and the amount of care that they receive. So, uh, if there are uh, shepherd dogs, for instance, uh, those are likely to go out with, uh, with the flock. Their primary aim is to protect the flock from damage. So then, of course, uh, if there is a carnivore of, uh, that attacks the, the, the flock, then the primary role of the dogs is to uh, repel such an attack. Uh, if a dog is found on, um, in a farm or a village that borders some natural area, or if there's wildlife in those areas, then clearly those dogs are likely going to have a greater impact on the wildlife than dogs which are, say, in urban areas or dogs that are in villages. And this is what, we've, what we found as well. So um, we reviewed the literature and we found that a combination of population density of dogs, ranging behavior, uh, and a population density of dogs and ranging behavior contributes to the risk of, uh, of impact to, sim to, to sympatric carnivores, particularly. Um, a final degree, a final kind of interaction, one which I haven't mentioned yet, um, but one which is of increasing concern to uh, especially for carnivores that are closely related, especially for canids that are closely related to domestic dogs, is that of hybridization. So now, as I mentioned to you, 
dogs have evolved from have have been domesticated from wolves and they're still the same species they're still uh, they're still uh, technically a wolf so canis lupus familiaris is the scientific name for dogs so they're still very closely related to wolves and we often see hybridization between uh, wolves and domestic dogs such as you can see in this photo here um, more worryingly you could also see hybridization with other members of the canis family for example this is a, a pack of uh, golden jackals which have hybridized with dogs I, I, was, I was chatting to julie young earlier today and she says she's observed uh, something very similar in ethiopia and in the us you see coyotes hybridizing with wolves as well and this can um, this can have conservation implications uh, and it sort of um, impacts the, the the conservation of some of these lineages especially especially for endangered species uh, such as the himalayan wolf uh, or well or for red wolves but there's no evidence for dog red wolf uh, hybridization yet uh, now why does this happen well one reason is that dogs can also roam fairly uh, widely into areas of uh, wilderness or of areas of uh, biodiversity concern so these photos were taken uh, during the all india tiger census that is carried out every four years so these are camera traps that were set up within tiger reserves and um, you can see that these dogs have some of these are tens of kilometers inside tiger reserves and dogs have been fairly frequently observed the, the latest uh, estimation of tiger numbers found that dogs were more commonly found or more, more commonly seen in some tiger reserves than, than any other carnivore. So that's clearly a cause of worry um, because uh, canine distemper virus has also been recorded in tigers as well as in endangered Asiatic lions. We also reviewed the literature to see how, how often uh, dogs were reported to be reported to be found uh, within camera trap studies uh, across the world. And we found that dogs were either the most common or the second most common uh, carnivore recorded in camera trap studies uh, across the world. So this is not just something that's that's reported only in India. But this is this is this is seen fairly widely in many many other places, and the distance could be even up to ten kilometers from the nearest human habitation. So, what are the implications of this for wildlife? Well, in Asia especially, um, there's high densities of livestock and dogs across the landscape, but these human-dominated landscapes still support uh, a, a fair a fair number of wild predators and herbivores. But as there is a loss of habitat, increasing loss of habitat, fragmentation, there's also increased physiological stress on these species. Now this constant predation pressure from uh, the presence of dogs can uh, often tip the balance. So the, there's both disease as well as predation related mortality of native wildlife. And this direct and indirect um, impacts can often tip the balance and cause local extinction of many of these species. So that's the sort of uh, interactions we expect to have between dogs and wildlife. What about dogs and humans? Well, if, you know, these are our best friends. My, the title of my talk is, is about dogs being our best friends. But is this always a, a happy coexistence? Well, there are many instances of happy coexistence. You know, dogs, of course, are, are loved pets. They are also very, very useful for livestock herding. But there are also negative interactions. Dogs are disease vectors for several different zoonoses, uh, the most important of which being rabies. Uh, and we'll talk, short, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in a few minutes. Dogs can also 
be odd uh, enemies of livestock. Um, so, so while on the one hand, dogs can help prevent uh, attacks by wild carnivores on livestock, they can themselves be responsible for livestock attacks. Several studies across the world have now shown that domestic dogs can often kill more sheep than wolves do. In the US alone, more than $3 million worth of livestock damage is done by dogs. Uh, in France, for instance, 90% of sheep depredation has been caused by dogs. And although, uh, although dogs are very commonly used as livestock guardian dogs to protect livestock from predators, um, increasingly there's evidence that dogs themselves uh, can cause more damage to livestock than any wild predator can. Um, this is the case in India as well. We did a study, this was led by my former PhD student, Chandrima. She's sitting here, uh, she's seen here with her little daughter while she was doing her field work. And she did field work in some of the toughest conditions in the world. So this little contraption that she's sitting in is locally called a helicopter. Uh, and, it's, and it was used, it's, it's a cable way, it's a rope way uh, to cross over from one valley to another in the high Himalayas. So her study area was this, um, this remote valley uh, up in the Himalayan region of Himachal Pradesh. This is called the Upper Spiti landscape. It, um, it's at the, the valley itself is at 3,200 meters and the highest elevation is 6,700 meters. It's a, it's a high altitude desert and it's breathtakingly beautiful. Um, the people of this region um, are either are, um, have either animal rearing as their main occupation or, or cultivate whatever they can during the short growing season um, in the valleys, in the fertile valleys. But in the last 10 years or so, uh, this area has seen a major upheaval. Unfortunately, because of dogs. Um, uh, this valley was cut off for most of the year because of its remoteness, but with the building of good roads, it led to a huge influx of tourism. And with tourism, uh, it brought in more, more infrastructure. So the, the, the main town in this area uh, suddenly had a huge out, uh, growing of tourist uh, um, hotels and homestays. Unfortunately, the garbage disposal here was a big problem. It wasn't, it wasn't taken care of very well. And the few dogs that were present here found this much to their liking and the population increased to a very large extent. So the population went from less than 100 dogs to about 800 dogs over a matter of few years. The dogs started spilling over into the nearby villages and soon started killing livestock. How many livestock? A lot. Um, over the years, dogs were responsible for killing uh, far more livestock than any of the other pred predators that were there uh, in that region. Uh, and in fact, soon became the largest cause of livestock mortality in this landscape. Dogs also started creating a problem for people. Uh, before, before 2010, that is before the tourism boom, the number of dog bite cases that were reported to the primary health, uh, to the hospital was negligible. But after, after the tourism boom and after the subsequent increase in dog populations, the number of bite cases have also increased. Thankfully, rabies is not, not such a big concern in this area yet. So in one year, we recorded 238 livestock mortalities. Um, we, did, we did an analysis and we found that 80% of the livestock that were killed by dogs were small and medium ruminants. So they were uh, sheep, goats, and donkeys. Most of these attacks occurred during the daytime and almost half of them occurred even when the livestock herder was present with them. 
there was also an interesting pattern of when these um, when these attacks occurred over the course of the year. Um, most of these attacks occurred during the autumn or the fall season. This is when um, this is post harvest. So this is when livestock are left in uh, free, free to roam in the fields around the villages. And uh, there's very few herders present because most of the, the people are busy uh, um, harvesting, their, harvesting their, their crops. So this is when most of the dog attacks were reported in this region. We also look to see of the total number of livestock cases that were lost. So all of the livestock that were lost during 2013-14, we looked at what the various causes of livestock loss were. And we found that 77% of these livestock that were lost uh, were due to predation, of which a staggering 63% were uh, losses to dogs um, and snow leopards and wolves accounted for the rest. Um, leading to a loss of almost 50,000 US dollars for the local population. Now this is a huge sum of money because uh, the median annual or the median income for most of these people is only a few hundred dollars. So uh, a loss of almost $50,000 total for that population is really, really high amount. And it, and it results in almost 40% of economic, uh, economic loss per household per year contributed by dogs. Now, even though snow leopards um, killed far fewer numbers of prey, they also killed larger livestock. So more, uh, more yak and uh, yak cow hybrid. Uh, so these are more valuable animals. So, the, uh, so obviously their monetary value is, is higher. But there's a compensation scheme. So there's an insurance scheme that runs in this, in this region, uh, which compensates people if their animals are killed by wild predators. But unfortunately, there's no compensation scheme if their livestock are killed by domestic dogs. So people really suffer high losses. Um, but this doesn't mean that you know everything's bad. We still, you know. People are not affected directly by, by domestic dogs, are they? Well, that's not entirely true. Uh, India, unfortunately, and across the world and many other countries in the world, dog bite cases on people are really high. So this is just in my hometown of Bangalore. Um, anywhere between, 50, between five to 15,000 um, dog or 25,000 dog bite cases are reported every year. And it's not just bites. Uh, we have to worry about a far more deadly disease, rabies. Uh, rabies is, uh, is considered a neglected tropical disease. There is no cure for rabies, but it's quite easily preventable. But India, unfortunately, has the dubious distinction of having the highest number of rabies cases worldwide at about 20,000 rabies cases. This is in humans. So there are about 20,000 uh, human deaths due to rabies every year. The global um, rabies uh, mortality in humans is about 60,000. So we contribute a third. Um, India, of course, also has the highest number of dog bite cases in the world at about 20 million uh, dog bite cases per year. I'm not sure any of you here would have seen a rabid dog, but it's not a pleasant sight. So let me just show you what a normal rabbit dog would look like or what most people assume a rabbit dog would look like. You know, it's, it's aggressive, it's chewing, it's biting. And that's what most people assume a rabbit dog would look like. But that's not always the case. Um, rabbit dogs can also uh, look disoriented. They can be not aggressive. Uh, they can just, you know, they can just look sick uh, in, in this instance. Or, or even just lie quietly in one corner uh, and be completely non-aggressive. And quite a few of the cases that are reported uh, show this symptom as well. Okay? And anybody who's, uh, who's been bitten by a dog like this will not suspect that that dog was rabid and therefore may not go and get the necessary treatment. 
Grape is, in fact, um, is such a, it, you know, it's such a dangerous disease. It's one of the few diseases where uh, mortality is almost guaranteed if you, if you end up contracting rabies. It's preventable, it's very easily preventable with a vaccine, a very effective vaccine. But if you don't get that treatment in time, then there's almost no, then there is no hope. More or less, there is no hope. Uh, it's not treatable. There are only a few handful of cases uh, of people who are having, having survived rabies. Um, it's in fact been called the world's most diabolical virus, um, also because of its uh, association. There's, there's a lot of uh, association with vampires and zombies and so on, um, because of the way people behave, have been known to behave once rabid. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, India has the dubious distinction of having the highest number of human deaths per year. Okay. Um, so what we wanted to do was, you know, why we wanted to find out what is the real uh, pattern of rabies occurrence in, uh, in, in, in cities in particular in India. Um, and, and so we did some systematic surveillance for rabies in one fairly large city. This is Pune city in Western India. Uh, it's got a population of about 8 million, okay? And this is what we found. So each of those red dogs that you see there is one, is a confirmed case of rabies, okay? And so this is what we observed over the period of one year that we were monitoring this population. Now, most of these are free, ro free roaming dogs that you would see in the streets of the city roaming around here. Yeah? So it's clearly quite alarming. Um, overall, we had 318 suspected cases that we tested of which uh, uh, we got 167 positive uh, canine rabies cases and even three bovine cases. So clearly the dogs had been spreading rabies to other animals as well. Um, we even uh, noted 32 people who had been bitten by confirmed rabid animals, but thankfully all of them managed to get uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. That, that is, they managed to get their vaccines in time, and therefore there were zero human cases uh, from Pune City, at least, in that year. Now, we know that most rabies cases, though, come from rural areas. So that's, that's where uh, we tend to target, or we should target most of our rabies control efforts. Um, unfortunately, dogs in India and in many other countries in the world are problematic, not just for killing livestock or for uh, spreading rabies, but they've also been known to kill people directly. So packs of dogs have been known to kill children quite often in India. And um, this can lead to retaliation, as you can imagine. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to show you a disturbing photo. So it's, a, it's just a warning for that. So people then retaliate and, uh, and kill dogs. Uh, and on the other side, uh, animal lovers come out in, uh, in protest against these killings, that is against the killing of dogs, uh, with very heartfelt um, messages and organizations such as PETA and, uh, and FIAPO, which is, which is a federation of Indian animal protection organizations and Humane Society uh, and the Humane Society of India and so on, petition the courts or the government to stop to get the killings stopped. Um, but very little action is taken by these organizations to prevent the conflict in the first place. Which leads me to ask a broader question. Why does that happen? Now, if, if we imagine dogs to be an invasive species, okay, um, and if we had to treat them like any other invasive species, what would we do? So let's take rats, for example. Uh, rats are known to be one of the world's worst invasive species. Uh, rats are also a pest in cities across the world. And nobody bats an eyelid when rats are uh, exterminated or eradicated uh, from, from different areas for conservation or for human benefit. Uh, similarly, in Australia, the cane toad is an invasive species. 
um, as are red foxes and cats. And so these are all um, fairly cruelly sometimes uh, eliminated using poison baits and so on. And this is all, uh, this is all government sanctioned. This is mandated uh, by law even. Uh, even in the US, there are laws that uh, free ranging dogs should be removed from streets and uh, either put in shelters uh, or be humanely euthanized if they're no longer, if they're not adapted. So as I end my talk, I want us to revisit um, our relationship with some of our domesticated companions. We clearly share a very, very close bond with them. Okay? Um, but that sometimes clouds our thinking of our relationship with these animals. And that can happen to the detriment of the, uh, the welfare of these animals themselves as well as the welfare of other animals um, and even the welfare of human beings who tend to live in close association with these animals. Um, with that, I'll end my talk. And if there are questions, I can take them now.